continue with Leonardo's second lecture. Okay, thank you. So um, today we will uh, switch gears from the um, basic Lagrangian approach we had yesterday to this more abstract uh, conformal booster viewpoint that I uh, outlined in my colloquium yesterday. But uh, to recap, um, let's uh, remind ourselves of some basic notations. So these are my conventions for the n equal to 2 vector multiplet, and this is my convention for the n equal to 2 half hyper. And um, there is a um, alpha and alpha dot are spinor indices. I that runs from 1 to 2 are SU2 R indices. So you can see that the K genus uh, of the vector multiple form an SU2 R doublet. Um, you may wonder about the SU2R transformation properties here in the half hyper multiplet. They are uh, a little bit hidden, and, um, uh, but essentially it's the scalars that carry the SU2R representation. This is most um, made most transparent if we graduate ourselves with the n equal to two full hyper, which is two copies of the half hyper. And then one would, for, would construct a doublet, uh, which would be um, the combination of Q and Q tilde star. This complex conjugation is actually necessary to make manifest the transformation properties under SU2R. So in my notations, Q and Q tilde are both n equal one chiral multiplets. But in this n equal one notation, the SU2R transformation properties are a little bit hidden. And finally, uh, I didn't spend much time on this yesterday, but in my conventions, the U1R assignment is minus one for, uh, for the complex scalar in the vector multiplet, and it necessarily it must be zero for the complex scalar in the hyper multiplet. And um, these are conventions such that the um, Supersymmetry generators carry, they're of course SU2R doublet. You see this index i, and they carry r equal plus a half. And so, since we go from phi to the lambdas with the q, this is r equal minus a half, and this is r equal to zero, whereas this would be r equal plus a half. Again, since I'm at it, let's also write once more. Symmetry algebra. And then, yes, in the discussion section, I took the opportunity to also introduce the um, S superconformal fermionic generators, which um, square onto the special conformal generators. So I don't have too much time to review this in enormous detail, but there is this name, 2 to 2 slash 2. Again, if you want to learn about super algebras, Wikipedia is pretty great. Wikipedia entries are generally terrible for physics, but for cultural reasons that I don't fully understand, mathematicians spend an enormous time editing Wikipedia, and so the mathematics entry in Wikipedia are actually quite good. And, um, and so anyway, it, it doesn't matter. You can learn about it in Wikipedia, but, but the generators of the algebra are uh, the momentum generators, the special conformal generator, the translation, the Lorentz generator, which I'm here, I'm writing in by spinor notation. So this is three plus three. And then there are the fermionic generator that I just wrote down. And finally, so there's Q, Q tilde, S and S still, then finally, last but not least, there are the SU2R times U1R generators. Okay, so that is a recap of conventions and basic algebraic facts. Uh, and 
from now on, I would like to um, um, switch to this more abstract conformal field theory viewpoint. So here we have elementary uh, Lagrangian fields, and in a we are interested in remember we're interested in gauge theories in in. So actually, let me finally let, let me also review very briefly the story of n equal to two Lagrangian theories. So the data are a choice of semi-simple gauge group cannot contain one factors, and then a pseudo real representation R of G under which the uh, half hyper multiple transform and uh, and then the condition that the, the beta function must vanish imposes restrictions on this uh, data and the only continuous data one is left with if you insist on conformality are the complexified gauge coupling for each of the simple factors of the gauge group. So in such a setup, we have elementary fields. The vector is in the adjoint, so this is in, in adjoint of G, whereas the half hyper in some representation R of G. And um, we are going to be interested in correlation functions of local gauge invariant operators. So is a local gauge invariant combination of the elementary fields. And so the local operators of the conformal field theory in this description are um, really made up of these elementary constituents. Um, and that's the fallback option and intuition to which you can always go back to if you are confused by something, just try to realize uh, the abstract statement that I'm going to make in terms of these uh, fundamental ingredients. Uh, but the viewpoint I'm going to take uh, is that these are the basic objects and we do not necessarily need to think of each of these local operators as being a composite operator of something more fundamental. So um, as a way of transitioning, let's uh, give examples of what these local operators are in a Lagrangian theory. and so. We could be very concrete. We could take G to be SUN, uh, and then we take R to be, uh, well, um, we did a, a little exercise yesterday with the, beta, with the vanishing of the beta function. We concluded that if we insist that the hypermultiple in the fundamental representation, we need to take NF fundamental with NF is equal to 2N. And so, um, so here uh, it's the full hypermultiplet story. So I'm going to have uh, Q and Q tilde, where Q would be in the fundamental and Q tilde would be in the anti-fundamental of the gauge, of the um, of everything really. So, um, so. Um, so let's even fix indices. Let's A going from 1 to N be the gauge index. And so this would be an upper index A to the node the fundamental representation. And this would be a lower index A to the node the anti-fundamental representation. And, um, and in order to uh, ensure a vanishing of the one loop beta function, we need to take an F copy. So I'm going to add an additional index I that goes from 1 to nf, which is always equal to 2n, if you want conformality. And, and so these objects will be in the uh, fundamental or sun gauge. And this would be, um, well, really unf, because they're also charged under the u1 uh, flavored symmetry. OK? So that's our matter. And then our uh, gauge fields, of course, would transform in the adjoint. So I could use a uh, fundamental and a fundamental notation where it's implicit that the trace vanishes. Or alternatively, I could introduce um, 
an adjoint x and a that goes from 1 to n squared minus 1 uh, and rewrite this object as a single adjoint. OK? So that's a simple example of a n equal to 2 super conformal field theory. And then we would construct local gauge invariant operators by um, contracting gauge indices. And so uh, examples of, oh, of these local OIs would be, for example, trace phi squared, trace phi to the k, et cetera, et cetera phi to the phi cube, et cetera. And, or you could uh, have objects that contain the Qs. You could do Q i a q um, tilde uh, j a, where the index a is contracted. You have always to contract, um, you, have, you must all contract gauge indices. So this object would be, will carry some uh, flavor representation in this i and j. Okay, so we will come back to this example to illustrate some of the features of what we do more abstractly. OK, questions about this? OK, so I, had, I gave you yesterday a lightning review of, uh, of the conformal booster philosophy. Uh, I'm really, I really have to take for granted you know, the basics of conformal field theory, uh, such as, for example, uh, the statement that in conformal field theory, there is a isomorphism between um, the space of states. So there is a Hilbert space of states H. And then there are local operators, like the ones I just described. And the space of local operators at a fixed point, which, for example, uh, we, we could fix to be at the origin is isomorphic to the space of to the Hilbert space of states of the quantum theory. And how do you go back and forth? Well, you can construct a state by taking a, an operator and acting on it on the conformal invariant vacuum. It's, uh, that's clear enough. It's a little more subtle, but nevertheless possible, and one can make this rather precise, to reconstruct uniquely the state starting from the operator. And intuitively, if you have a pathetical description, the way you're going to do it is to insert the operator at the origin, do a path integral, and then cut open the path integral on a sphere. Let's do this in um, four dimensions. So we use the dilation operator as our Hamiltonian. and so. Uh, surf surfaces of constant radius, which are three spheres, are our special slices. And so in this quantization scheme, which is called radial quantization, uh, we have to construct wave functionals of the fields at this, say, at the unit sphere. And if we insert an operator there and we do a path integral, that defines a state. But the statement really can be made more axiomatic and more abstract without resorting to the path integral. Uh, and that is the state operator map in three minutes. Okay, so um, I can perhaps leave those notations there. So um, it follows almost immediately from the assertion that there is a state operator map uh, that you have a convergent operator Prados punch which I, again, briefly sketched in my talk yesterday. And um, the idea being that if you have two local operators, you can read off the state here and then use the state operator map to construct a local operator back. And with a little bit of thinking, you can see that this is a, that the convergent DOP just follows from completeness of uh, states in the Hilbert space. So, so these are all things that I'm going to pretty much assume. Uh, they, are now, they are now very nice uh, 
pedagogic reviews on the whole conformal. First of all, most of what I said is already in chapter two of the Steam Theory textbook by Paul Chinsky, but a more modern presentation that applies to higher dimension can be found in many lecture notes. By example, for example, I can uh, recommend the ones by Slava Richkov, David Simmons, that thing. It's a well-established story that I invite you to study. And so again, the idea is that we have this um, operator product expansion with some um, efficient functions here which are fixed by conformal covariance. The sum runs over the entire set of local operators, which as I just said is isomorphic to a set of states. And this uh, expansion is absolutely convergent inside a correlation function till the insertion of the next operator. So if this is operator one, this is operator two, and then I have some operator three here, you draw a big sphere which um, is, does not encounter any uh, additional insertions and by the argument that I just sketched, you can uh, replace these two operators by a single operator, say at the center of the sphere. Okay? So, clearly we want to uh, make use as much as possible of the symmetries of the problem and let's start phasing the pure, let's start with the, the pure conformal case. I already in the discussion section I took advantage of you and already quick, quickly sketch how the representation theory works. So I phrased the discussion yesterday at the level of states and I asserted that the primary state is by definition a state which is annihilated by the special conformal generators. The operator version of the statement is the statement that the operator that corresponds to the state psi commutes with the, uh, the operator at the origin commutes with the special conformal transformation. It's, it's necessary to put this at the origin because if you're away from the origin there is an orbital piece of the action of the special conformal generator which will not vanish. And then, um, given this definition, then we classify representations in terms of the conformal dimension delta, which in, I interchangeably also denote by the energy E, because I was just said, just said that we do, we quantize the theory in radial quantization, and then restrict it now to four dimensions by the two cartons of the Lorentz group. If we are in Euclidean space, we have SO4, which is the same thing as SU21 times SU22, and these are the two uh, spins. Or, of course, the Lorentz version is similar. You are familiar with, you can label lot of representations with two spins, where now this J, I are half integers. Okay? And so, by what, I, what I really mean by the state is the highest weight state of the two SU2s. Okay? So, it has definite conformal dimension, it's the highest weight state of the two SU2s, and it's definite Cartan quantum number under each of the SU2s. And then we will build the whole module by acting on this state with the arbitrary amount of raising operators, which are the P's, and arbitrary amounts of the, also the Lorentz raising generators, which would be, well, whatever, J minus one, J minus two, Etc. So the action of P mu on operators is just by taking derivatives. And so this is um, just a restatement of the fact that the full conformal representation is built on a primary by taking arbitrary amount of derivatives and, of, and then rotating in all possible ways, the, the Lorentz quantum numbers. Okay, so for example, for a scalar, operator O of X, which for example, the, the one that I had earlier, something like trace phi squared of X could be an example of that. We build the full module just by acting uh, with derivatives in all possible ways, and states that have a, a non-zero number of derivatives will be, be called conformal descendants 
of O. OK, so this operator I should put at the origin. And this is the full module. OK, so in general, um, for, gen for gen the generic choice of the quantum numbers of the operator, this module is irreducible. But, um, and this is a phenomenon that will become more involved in the superconformal case, so I'm, I want to give a five minute discussion of the conformal case first. If you suitably tune these quantum numbers, the module becomes reducible, and, um, um, well, and then you get shorter representations if you impose su suitable conditions. Another way of saying this is we are going to impose uh, the condition of unitarity. So we want norms to be positive. And it turns out that if you tune the quantum number suitably, you will encounter that some of the descendant states have zero norm. And they are orthogonal to the entire uh, module. And so you really, in a unitary theory, really instruct to mod out by these null states. And you get a shortened representation. So, um, so the unitarity bounds on conformal representations are that delta or the same, which is really for me. So if I take the, the two spins to be both, uh, both of them non-zero, so I'm going to sit down to four dimensions, and the two spins are both non-zero, then unitarity imposes Uh, this condition, um, if one of them is zero, then uh, unitarity imposes this condition. And of course, there's a com completely analogous uh, condition if this is true. Uh, and finally, if both spins are zero, unitarity imposes uh, this condition, OK? So, um, so the statement that I'm making is that, um, so how, how does this come about? These conditions come about by starting with a state of arbitrary, let's say, let's do, let's do, we do the case with the spins are both non-zero. I start with the highest weight, and I act with p, and co start computing norms. And I must require that all the norms of the descendant states are positive. The matrix of norms is positive definite. It turns out that this is only possible when this condition is obeyed. If you violate this condition, in fact, in this simple case, you will encounter a negative uh, eigenvalue already at the, at the first step. So if you start with an operator with spin uh, of whatever it is, of this type, and you act with uh, the momentum, and you compute the norm, and you impose that this is positive, this will inst instantly give you this condition. Okay, it's a simple exercise that you can do. How do you do it? Well, you just remember that in radial quantization, p dagger is equal to k, and so you can just compute this norm by uh, the commutation relations of the, you were gonna get you know, pa, p dagger, which is the same as k, and so you can just compute this norm by commuting k and p using the commutation relation of the conformal algebra. And it's a simple exercise that you can do. And it will give you this unitarity bound. It also follows from this way of introducing the unitarity bound that if the unitarity bound is saturated, you are in the critical case where this, there's a certain, OK, so uh, this is, of course, a little bit schematic. So you have, there are, this is a whole matrix, right? Because uh, because there are choices of, of indices that you have to make. So it's, it's the statement that this, this matrix is positive semi-definite. And uh, the statement that you're saturating the unitarity bound is the statement you're going to find a certain linear combination of the states of this kind, uh, which has zero norm. And one, if you go through this desert size, which I really invite you to do, I mean, it's a little tricky, it's a little involved, but once in your life, uh, you are going to discover 
that the combination that uh, is acquiring zero norm is uh, this one. It's a combination where we are um, contracting precisely uh, one um, alpha and alpha dot index, or, okay, so I'm trying to be too general. Let's do the simple case where, where we have a tensorial operator so that we can use, that we can use, um, um, that we can use um, vector indices that I mean by spinner indices, so we have a tensor, say a symmetric trace this tensor, and then this condition is simply the condition that the divergence of this operator uh, is zero, okay? So you have discovered that there is a state in the module that has zero norm, and so since we're insisting that the representation to be unitary, we must mod out by it, and so this means that we're going to impose this as a relation obeyed by the operator. You will recognize that this is simply the relation that says that this operator is a conserved current, okay? So so we now have a little interesting result in that follows just from representation theory, that if you know for a fact that the operator has this dimension, you immediately uh, conclude that, uh, that the operator has, is, has zero divergence. The case that we will, the cases that of course are uh, of physical interest are, uh, So let's do the following example. So of course, simplest case is J mu, which is the same as J alpha alpha dot. So that means that J equal J, J1 equal J2 equal one half, and then the unitarity bound tells me that E should be greater or equal than three. And if E is equal to three, then this is a conserved current, which is hopefully familiar for you. Nether currents are at dimension three. That's obvious at the classical level, but now the same in here at the full-fledged quantum level, it's an if and only if. If the current remains conserved, it has dimension fixed to three, and if it has dimension three, it must be conserved. And the other, of course, case of paramount importance would be the stress energy tensor, J mu nu or T alpha one, alpha two, alpha dot one, alpha dot two. This is J one equal J two equal to one. And so the unitarity bound tells me that for a spin two operator of this kind, he has to be greater or equal than four. And if E is equal to four, then this operator is conserved. Um, of course, you can consider uh, objects with more indices, and those would be conserved currents of spin greater than two. And it's, um, it's a theorem derived under very uh, general broad assumptions that the presence of higher spin conserved currents, whether higher spin, I mean spin greater than two, implies on abstract grounds that the theory is free or more precise, that it contains a subsector that must be described by brief free fields. Okay, so, um, you can entertain yourself, take a free, your favorite free field theory, the free, theory of a free uh, scalar in four dimensions, you can co explicitly construct by linears of dot scalar with sprinkle with various derivatives which are conformal primaries and that uh, obey this conservation condition. And the statement is that there is a converts statement that if you find a, a conserved current of spin greater than two, then you must identify a free subsector in the theory. This is great from the, our general booster viewpoint because we understand free field theories perfectly, and so we shouldn't bother with them. And so we are going to impose as a condition on the theories that we want to study that there are, must be no conserved currents of spin greater than two. And so we can impose from the get-go that we're just talking about interacting quantum field theory. 
Um, so, um, the, um, you see, the, the, the point here is that if I think of theory abstractly in terms of this list of, of operators, in particular in the list of conformal representation that the theory contains, I can detect whether it's free or not just by looking at the list. So the statement that the theory is free or not is a statement that I can immediately read off from the so-called conformal data. The conformal data will be the list of dimensions and the list of OP coefficients, and in particular, just from, I mean, dimensions and, uh, and, and, um, and Lorentz quantum numbers and their OP coefficients, those are the conformal data that determine the theory completely, and it's a very simple statement about uh, just looking at the representation that tells me that the theory is free or not. The other um, thing that we're going to impose is that the theory contains one and precisely one uh, conserved current of spin two, which we identifies as the energy tensor. This is again obvious in the Lagrangian viewpoint. You can just construct the stress tensor by your favorite procedure, either the nether procedure where then you have to improve it or coupling it to a background metric, blah, blah, blah. It's clear that if you start with the Lagrangian, local Lagrangian, there's gonna be a stress tensor. And it should also be clear that if the theory is interacting, the stress tensor is unique. In the free field limit, the theory could actually has multiple conserved currents of spin two because each Let's say I have a theory of n scalar fields. Each scalar field will have its own separate spin two conserved uh, current. But the moment you do a non-interaction, you generically expect that, they, that most of, uh, of these spin two objects acquire anomalous dimension. And remember my unitarity theorem, the moment you have an anomalous dimension, you instantly lose conservation and, and vice versa. And in fact, um, if that's not the case, is as if you turn on interaction, you find still that a generic point in coupling space, you have two separate stress tensors. So what that really means that you're talking about a product theory. Okay, so we are going to restrict attention into simple theories. There's a condition, if you are analogous to, again, remember I had this analogy yesterday where it is a, a little bit as if we are trying to classify Lie algebras and then clearly Sure, you can study the most general semi-simple case, but it's easier to impose from the get-go that we're looking at a single irreducible simple piece. And um, what about the spin one object? Well, the spin one object is, of course, is the hallmark that the theory has a global symmetry. That's, again, obvious from the Lagrangian viewpoint. If you have a global continuous symmetry, you use Nether's theorem uh, to construct uh, the conserved current. Um, and we are going to, to um, assume on abstract grounds that that's always the case. That if, uh, uh, in some sense, this is part of our axiomatic definition. In a, we're going to declare that we have a local conformal field theory if, first of all, it has a unique stress tensor and second of all, if the theory is invariant under a continuous group of global symmetries, there is an associated conserved current, which of course we have to transform in the adjoint of the flavored symmetry group. Okay, so far so good. This is uh, the abstract version of Nether's theorem, which does not have a proof. Okay, nobody really knows how uh, to uh, prove this fact uh, from a reasonable set of uh, axioms for local conformity theory. You can do what Harlan or Guri do, which is uh, basically formulate a framework where it's basically obvious that this is true. But uh, a, more, uh, a more conceptual understanding of this, in fact, it would be not lovely to be able to prove that just the assumption of this to the local stress tensor implies that uh, whenever the theory is invariant under a global continuous symmetry, then it has a conserved current. For us, this would be an assumption. Okay, so um, 
I'm not going to do this in great detail, but it turns out that these are free fields, so we will not care about them. And then uh, this is also a free field. Uh, sorry, but what I, what I mean by this is if, when you saturate uh, these unitarity bounds, you find, you find free fields. So a simple example for this would be a self -dual, the self-dual two-form for a Maxwell field. Uh, obeys this bound, right? Because this is, it's a self-dual form, so it has e equal to two, and then it has j, well, okay, with the dots, j1 equal to zero, j2 equal to one, and so it obeys this bound, and it's, this is just the whole, the, the same that there is a max, free Maxwell field, which again, will not be of interest for us because we are gonna restrict ourselves to interacting field theories. And when you saturate this bound, of course, we are talking about a free scalar, okay? A object where, which has E equal to one and this condition is just a free scalar. In this case, is the only one where you need to work a little bit harder because the null state that uh, forces the unitarity bound happens at level two. And so the condition that uh, the, the representation be unitary is the condition that box phi equal to zero, which is, of course, just a free equation of motion. Okay, so that's a lightning review of representation theory of the conformal group. It's rather simple, really. Most representations are generic, and then when you saturate one of these unitarity bounds, you need to remove just a little bit of, of, of null states, which is a, a single null states, and of course, all of its descendants. Clear enough? Yeah. Yes. I just told you. I, I, uh, that's my main point, right? That I don't have to ever think in terms of elementary fields. I just look at the list of representations, and, and, I, and I, if a certain unitarity bound is obeyed, well, if the unitarity bound that correspond to free fields are obeyed, I'm going to say that there is a piece of the theory which is free, and I don't want to consider that. I mean, I can consider the case if I, if I insist, and it's going to be trivial. But uh, since we don't want to get confused by free fields, we will just assume that no such representations appear. Now, it's the picture that I was drawing yesterday of the space of, uh, of the conformal manifold. So the, the, the statement that I'm making, a generic point in the conformal manifold, none of these uh, free representations appear, but they might appear, and generically they will appear, at singular points. Okay, so in fact, yes, I had this conjecture that the conformal manifold of a general to two theory arises by weak gauging in a certain limit of, uh, uh, of a gauge group. Well, when you switch off that gauge coupling, then clearly the, you, you, you spit out a free vector multiplet. Okay, so the free vector multiplet and several of its composite will violate, will obey some of those unitarity bound and, well, at this special point, uh, you will have, in fact, multiple stress tensor, higher spin conserved currents. But the beauty of this approach is that we can really now characterize, or if you want, define what the special points are by stating that, well, what is a special point? This point where you have enhanced higher spin uh, uh, conserved currents. Where you, sorry, where you, where you gain in the limit uh, higher spin conserved currents. Okay, so that was fast, but any other questions? I'm not going to repeat the same story in, for, n equal to, for the n equal to two super algebra. Okay, sorry. One uh, before I, I do that, let me mention um, a few other things that we can uh, state in great generality. So some of the conf uh, sort of most robust universal conformal data would be um, obtained from the three-point function of the conserved currents, if any, and of the stress tensor. 
And so in particular, the two-point function of the stress tensor, I'm not going to write the, the uh, tensorial structure, but in some normalization with the appropriate conventions is proportional. So first of all, the normalization with the stress tensor is canonically fixed because you want the, the stress tensor to be a generator of, in particular, translation. So you cannot mess up with the overall normalization of the stress tensor that's God given. And then given that normalization, the normalization of the two-point function of the sensor is interesting, and that is the so-called C-central charge. For a reason that will become appear shortly, I'm going to call this C4D. From the three-point function of the stress tensor, which is rather complicated, you admit several different tensorial structures, you can again recover C, but you can also recover another combination, which is the A-central charge. A alternative interpretation of these numbers is um, by thinking in terms of coupling the theory to a background uh, metric and looking at the uh, conformal an uh, anomaly, looking at the vial anomaly for the trace of the stress energy tensor, which is, of course, zero in the limit in R4, if you don't have any background metric, by assumption, that's a conformal field theory. But then um, uh, it will, um, um, okay, so um, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's, um, um, gonna C times Euler. Plus, uh, see, I think it's this, plus other terms which can be removed by local counter terms. So the A and C anomaly coefficients are um, important data of the conformal field theory, which you can read off which are really among the set of conformal data because I can read them off from the OP coefficients of the stress tensor. And famously, the A anomaly is the one, is the object which is uh, monotonic under RG flow, uh, whereas C is not. And then from the normalization of a non-abelian current, I wrote this expression yesterday, I'm not going to write it again, but in certain conventions that again are uh, you cannot really mess around with the normalization on a billion current because you, you need the conserved charges to obey the Lie algebra, which is which has fixed normalization. And then you can read off the uh, level K, which is another basic datum of your conformal field here. Okay. So now we do n equal to 2. So now my super primary is annihilated by S and S tilde. And it's going to be labeled by, well, the same thing as before, and then by the eigenvalues of big R and little r. Conceivably, there could be additional labels under uh, whatever global symmetry the theory may have. Okay, by what is by definition of a global symmetry, whatever symmetry generated that commute with the full superconformal algebra are gonna declare that they are a global or flavored symmetry. So a priori, of course, that's completely separate set of indices that you can tensor with this. Now, I don't have time to write down the whole list of uh, um, shortening condition because it's too much. But the story is similar in spirit. So again, the idea will be that you have a generic module that you obtain from the highest way state by adding in all possible ways with Q, Q tilde, does that, the anti-commutator anti that gives you P is automatically, and then the, the rate, whatever other uh, raising or lowering operator, whatever you want to call them, of the uh, art symmetry and of the Lorentz group you have. Uh, but for special values of the, um, of the quantum numbers, you develop null states when you saturate some unitarity bound, and then the module is 
uh, such that you must mod out by these null states and you get a short term representation. Or it's similar in spirit. And um, the shortening conditions now, um, remember before we just had uh, momenta, which means derivative. So the shortening condition for conserved currents were just the diversion of the current is zero. Now the form of the shortening condition will be the statement that some combination of the raising operator, which are the Qs, annihilate the uh, primary state. Okay, so this is something that may be familiar to many of you. It's a BPS type condition. It's a statement that the state or the operator, if you use a state operator map, is invariant under some combination of the supercharges. Okay, so we are going to uh, um, have two distinct um, BPS type conditions which by uh, a universally followed convention introduced by Dora and Osborne they are called B-type and C-type. And the B-type shortening conditions are, um, so we have a state, um, okay, so um, um, the B-type shortening condition will be of the form that the full supercharge Q alpha annihilates the state for both choices of the Weil spinner index alpha. And when this is true, it, this automatically implies that the corresponding Lorentz quantum numbers must be zero. Okay, so this is, a, the, in other terms, this is something, this is a gadget that can contain alpha dot indices and then I can impose Q alpha equal to zero for both choices of alpha. Clear enough? Whereas the C type is a condition where I'm going to contract the um, alpha index with, the, with an alpha index. So this can have a bunch of alpha and alpha dot indices. And uh, clearly this is a weaker condition because this is two condition and this is a single one because it's just the contracted version of the story. Okay, by contraction, sorry, should be clear. I'm just contracting the SU2 indices with an epsilon tensor. Okay, so I've done this for Q, but of clearly there are, there are the completely analog condition for Q tilde. And then we have to remember that the Qs and the Q tildes have SU2R indices. And so in their full glory, the shortening condition that you can have are B1, B2, B tilde 1, B tilde 2, C1, C2, C tilde 1, and C tilde 2. So the B1 condition will be the condition that says the Q1 alpha annihilates the state and then necessarily J1 equal to zero and J2 is arbitrary. C clearly similarly for B2, this is just a statement about the um, choice of SU2R index. And then this is the, the complete analogous condition but for the Q tilde. And in this case, J2 will have to be zero and J1 is arbitrary. And etc. C1 would be the condition, let me put C upper one, Q1 alpha contracted with alpha equal to zero, etc. Hopefully this is clear. Actually, there's a small subtlety. This is the, the version of the C condition uh, if J1 is different from zero, but, okay, I should have said this here. So this is the condition for J1 different from zero. There is an analogous version, uh, the correct version of the uh, C condition if J1 is equal to zero, it's the square of the Q that will annihilate the state. So it's a level two condition. And then this object has no alpha indices. Okay, so of course I'm not, 
deriving any of this, but I'm simply stating that these are the only possible null states that can appear when you start computing uh, norms uh, of descendant states. Clear? It's the generalization of the condition that the divergence of the current was zero. It now it's this more elaborate set of conditions that you can impose. The B condition are twice as strong as the C conditions. And so in some part of the literature, the B condition will be called shortening conditions and the C condition will be called semi-shortening, but whatever. Exactly, and now of course the question is, given that these are the possible um, uh, special um, condition we can have, now we can mix and match. And, they, and now that's where the story really becomes a little bit baroque, because you now can start taking various multiple conditions at the same time, and that gives rise to a whole zoo of possible short and superconformal multiple. But the, um, it's also clear, however, that not anything goes, okay? Because uh, we must be compatible with the, uh, you know, I impose two conditions on the primary state. If I commute them or anti-commute them, I must find something con consistent. And so the anti-commutation of, of multiple conditions I impose will further constrain the quantum number of my primary because well, remember, for example, by, cons by assumption, the S's annihilate the state. So if I impose a certain Q annihilate the state, the anti-commutator of Q with S must also vanish. The commutator of Q with S contains Lorentz and arts symmetric quantum numbers. So that means that um, I will find relations with these quantum numbers. And if I, to greedy, and I start imposing too many of these conditions, I could discover that this uh, uh, conditions are not compatible, and so simply there's no solution uh, where I try to impose all of them. A simple condition that it should be immediately obvious, if I try to impose simultaneously B1 and B tilde 1, that means that I'm trying to say that something is simultaneously annihilated by um, by uh, Q1 alpha and q tilde 1 alpha dot. But of course, q1 and q tilde 1, given that this is an upper index, this is a lower index, commute to the momentum. And so this implies that um, the state is indicated by momentum, but the only transitional invariant state in quantum field theory is the vacuum. And so this implies that this is just the vacuum. So that's not interesting. So apart from the vacuum, there's no way I can impose these two conditions simultaneously. And so that's assuming that we have just one vacuum. OK, so, um, so what shall we do? So there's a whole story that I really cannot really summarize the next 10 minutes. But I will focus on the maximal, the maximally symmetric conditions. So, we have, so we have, uh, remember, 16 supercharges, which is 8 Qs or Q tildes plus 8 S and S tildes. The, these are automatically zero on the primary. And so I will enumerate the shortening condition, which are various uh, overlaps of those conditions, the result in 8 of the Qs annihilating the state. This is what you may reasonably want to call a one-half PPS condition because, okay, the S's are automatically zero, but if half of the Qs annihilate the state, that's one-half PPS. Okay. And so what are those? So, um, well, I told you you cannot do B1 and B tilde 1, but you surely can do B1 and B tilde 2. So that's a one-half BPS condition. 
that would set Q1 alpha equal Q tilde alpha dot equal to zero. And by playing the little game I, I mentioned earlier, commuting this Q and Q tilde with uh, the S's, et cetera, you learn that this implies, well, first of all, as part of the definition of the B condition, you know that J1 is equal to, well, not the definition, but you see. Okay, so why is it that this object must have J1 equal to zero? Well, because if I commute Q with S, which automatically annihilates Psi, I will find the Lorentz generators for, the le for, for J1, and those must annihilate the state, so this must be a singlet under the SU21 uh, subalgebra. So this is, must be a scalar. It has zero U1R and a priori non-zero uh, big R, and these are the famous for in some circles, um, B hat R multiplets. Okay, so they're completely specified by the only um, uh, non-vanishing uh, art symmetry, which is R, and uh, finally, the last condition, you find that E is equal to 2R. Okay. Then um, the other thing you can do is to impose B1 um, and B2 simultaneously. Uh, this, well, then I mean, let me not rewrite it, but this will lead to the condition that um, E, uh, this is what you'd call a, um, Okay, so I'm gonna get my conventions a little wrong, but let me call, okay, let me first put, this is a B hat R. This is gonna be an epsilon R or epsilon bar. So let me think for a second whether it's epsilon or epsilon bar. So um, this is, I think, is what I would like to call an epsilon bar multiplet. And this will have a positive little r symmetry, zero big R, and E will be equal to little r. And then there's the conjugate representation, which is the epsilon r, which will be this one. Yeah, how it will be negative. And these are all scalars. Okay, and finally, although uh, these are not what you normally call one half BPS because they are a combination, oh, well, okay, I, I need to delete it. They're a combination of semi-shortening conditions. You can get to, um, you get to um, uh, impose simultaneously all the C-type C conditions. They are half as strong, but if you impose all four of them, you get something consistent. And this multi, I mean, okay, I apologize, but this is a universal notation that I did not invent. But these are called the C hat zero J1, J2 multiplets. And they have um, a priori arbitrary J1 and J2. Big R is equal to little r, sorry, big R is equal to zero, little r is equal to J2 minus J1, and the dimension is uh, J1 plus J2 plus two. Okay, so these three types of multiplets are the one where you get to set four of the Qs to zero on the primary state. And now, um, very quickly, since this, of course, looks a little bit uh, esoteric, if you haven't seen it before, let's do a sanity check and let's go back to our Lagrangian example and let's give examples 
of this type of multiplets, okay? So let's start here because it's the easiest. So these are objects we ha which have a dimension equal to the little art symmetry. And you can hopefully quickly convince yourself that if you want to waste, if you do not want to waste, so the dimension has to be the smallest possible for given little art symmetry. And the only gadget that satisfies that condition in our set of characters is the phi field, right? And so these objects, which are clearly must be purely made of phi's. So the, in our conventions, phi has negative little r, so these objects would be trace phi to the k, whereas this one would be trace phi bar to the k. Okay? It's clear that in a, in a Lagrangian example, there cannot be anything else that obey this condition, because the moment you sprinkle in another field, you, you violate this condition. Uh, these objects, on the other hand, are the objects that minimize the dimension for given big R. And, well, okay, so, uh, sorry, I'm taking for granted you know how to count dimensions, right? So the dimension of phi is one, the dimension of the Gagino is three half, the dimension of A is again one, but of course if you want to make a gauge invariant you have to look at the field strength, etc. And again the dimension of the scalar is one here and the dimension of this spindle is three half. And well, the only way you can actually win this game is if you consider objects which are made of Q and Q tildes. Because the Q and the Q tildes are the objects which are in the doublet of SU2R. And so if, particularly if I look at the highest weight, the highest way to have, well, dimension one and art symmetry one half. And so it obeys this condition that the dimension is twice the art symmetry. And so this object here would be gauge invariant combinations of Q and Q tilde. So for example, earlier in our example, so we had the Q, we had Q A, Q T, I, I think I gave this as a, one of the elementary examples of a composite operator made of the Q. This object is gauge invariant because the color indices are contracted. It, it carries some representation under the flavored symmetry, which is in fact the adjoint representation of U and F. Okay. And what are these objects? The first statement I'm going to make is that if J1, uh, well, and with the exception, the only, the only multiple will be relevant for us is the one where the J1 and J2 are zero. Because for higher values than J1 and J2, this multiplet will contain uh, higher spin conserved currents, conserved currents of spin greater than two. So for J1 or J2 greater than zero, there are higher spin conserved currents inside this multiplet. Which, as we discussed, are the hallmark of a free theory. So we can find these type of multiplets in these degenerate limits, but generically we won't allow them. The lowest one is the one that contains the stress tensor. So this is the super conformal stress tensor multiplet in a n equal to two theory. This multiplet, okay, it starts, so let, let's quickly draw the structure of the multiplet. It starts with this, um, how should I call it? It starts with, a, uh, with an object of dimension two, which is uncharged under everything. And then you build the multiplet acting with supercharge. There are some fermions I will, I will not bother with. And then at dimension three, you're going to encounter the currents for the art symmetry, both for the U1R and the uh, SU2R. And then at dimension four, you're going to encounter the stress energy times. Okay. It's a famous fact in, uh, in supersymmetry in many cases where the art symmetry current and the stress tensor are part of the same multiplet. This is an illustration of that. 
you may be more familiar with the n equal one story. In the n equal to two story, the bottom component of the sensor multiplet is a uncharged scalar of dimension two. Okay, so in our, uh, in our Lagrangian example, this would be something like a trace of phi phi dagger, some number that I'm not gonna be able to remember, q q dagger plus q tilde q tilde dagger. Something like that. Okay, it's, it's a dimension two guy which is not holomorphic. Okay, so um, again, we will assume the existence of one and only one multiple of this kind and none of this kind for J. How am I doing with time? Done. Okay, so anyway, we made some progress.